Man, I, I love coming into the house and encouraging one another in our faith. How many of you enjoy that? Come on. You know, if, if you're new with us tonight, when we get together, man, what we strive to do is elevate our hope, strengthen our faith in Jesus, and experience the love of God in a powerful way from one another. And so we're glad you came to church tonight. This is our first Sunday night service. And as you look around the room, we're about halfway to where we want to be uh, over the next several weeks. We're probably at about 200, 250 people. We're striving to have 500 people here per weekend on Sunday night. And so our prayer is that you would not come alone to this service. You would bring somebody's with you. Come on. Again, we're glad you're here. You know, I couldn't help but notice, and I'm not gonna let you sit down yet, but I couldn't help but notice whenever we were basically doing those worship songs that Eddie, and David have on the same kind of tennis shoes. And so I thought I missed the memo and wearing black Converse's and white shoestrings. I got on a solid white shoes tonight. So I don't know why I told you that, but it just kind of stood out like a sore thumb. They're starting to dress alike, starting to look alike. And you know, the next thing we know, yeah. I said, great minds think alike. Yeah. The next thing is Eddie may get a new haircut like David's. And so, again, we're glad you're here to turn around, give somebody a high five, let them know you are glad to be at church tonight. Let them know that you're glad that they're at church tonight. Thank you so much, worship team. You are awesome. So, fantastic. And again, uh, you know, I just kind of wanted to top in before I get into uh, the word and the message today. I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing a Sunday night experience, why we're doing a, a Sunday night a service. We're, you know, on our Sunday morning experience, a lot of people come out for those experiences. And Sunday night is always going to look a little different than the Sunday morning. You're going to experience uh, sometimes different singers, different songs. You're not going to experience uh, different fellowship. You're going to experience different teachers. It's not always going to be the, the same face of teaching uh, each and every week. And, and our purpose in doing all of that is God calls the church to raise people up. And God calls the church to really help inspire people to uh, do things and spread his good news around the world. And so we're striving to create environments to really develop people. We're striving to create environments for you to step in and be able to serve at some capacity and join in in what God is doing around the world. You know, we never had a plan for, uh, to, to hold things to ourselves. Our plan has always been to be fruitful, multiply, and permeate God's presence throughout this earth. And so one of the reasons in starting this service is to allow other opportunities, other people to, to speak into the life of this church and really uh, grow in a powerful, powerful way. So I want to encourage you to come. I want to encourage you to bring people. One of the hardest things to ever do in church planting, that means starting a church or starting a service, is to gain momentum. Yeah. Is to gain momentum. And, and numbers are momentum because numbers of people are powerful. Yeah. And so I want you to know that if you really want this service to gain momentum and God to do amazing things in your life, go ahead and make a commitment to come for six straight weeks and bring somebody with you to this service every single week. And let's see what God can do as we do our part and he does his part. I'm amazed how God depends on us to do the work of the ministry. And, you know, that's really what his heart's desire is, is to involve us in what he's doing in the world. And I got so excited today. I, I follow several people on Instagram. I got a great friend. His name's Dr. Dave Martin. He's been here and communicated before. But today, he is in Indonesia, across the world. And he shares on his Instagram, he's speaking in a church in Indonesia that has four floors, escalators. It seats 3,500 people per service. 
And he is in the forest service and people are lined up outside for three hours waiting to get in the forest service of a 3,500 seat auditorium to praise a great God. I just need you to know today that God is at work around the world. And those kind of things really excite me because, you know, that is, that is the very power of God at work in his people. And again, I don't think God intends for us to go to sleep. I don't intend, I don't think God intends for us just to uh, kind of attend. I think God intends for us to permeate his name throughout this city and together we can make a world of difference. And so I'm really excited about this service and kicking this service off. And again, I'm going to encourage you and charge you, church, with bringing people with you to the services so that they can be empowered and become everything that God, God has created them to be. Now, today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a few reminders. Anybody got reminder uh, sounds on their phone? In the early service today, when Quinn was uh, talking at the 11 a.m. service, you know, I think three or four people had reminders on their phone, the sound reminders. Because <laughs> I was sitting right down here on the front row as Quinn was teaching, and I heard several reminders go off throughout the auditorium. And I'm like, man, you know, that's probably a really important reminder. Because that's what I have to do whenever... I need to know to be somewhere or do something. I have to kind of sometimes put reminders on my phone. You know, sometimes I set up a reminder a day ahead on the calendar thing, you know. Then it's two hours before. Then it's 30 minutes before just to kind of remind me. Anybody else do this? Right. Reminders? Yeah, because we all need reminders, especially in the world that we live in today because we get so busy, so occupied with so many things. Our minds are everywhere and really, you know, the scripture uh, speaks to uh, being reminded as believers in who we are and what our, our purpose is. When we come together as a church, it's not to only share who Jesus is. I think that's one of the most fabulous things that we can share. And we always need to keep, keep the message centralized around what Jesus has done and his empowerment in our life. However, believers need to be reminded. Believers need to be reminded over and over and over again of who they are, what their purpose is, what our assignment is, and what God is doing in and through us in life. And as one of the New Testament writers, Paul, he wrote many of the letters in your New Testament. He wrote them to churches and he wrote them to young pastors. Paul was into spiritual development. He was into developing people to become everything that God had created them uh, to be. And again, spiritual development isn't knowledge. It isn't just learning more about God. It's learning more about who God says you are and living it out each and every day. Amen. Someone was speaking to me before the service today and asked me, does the Holy Spirit speak to me? And I said, yes, often. And I said, because the Holy Spirit is developing me as a follower of Christ along my journey. And the Holy Spirit, uh, he, he doesn't only speak to me in, in meetings like this. The Holy Spirit, he speaks to me amidst meetings like this, but he also speaks to me daily and he prompts me uh, as I encounter people in situations and, and circumstances in my life because the Holy Spirit is a teacher. The Holy Spirit is your teacher and my teacher. And one of, the, one of the greatest things you can ever learn as a believer in Jesus Christ is how to be attentive to your teacher to your counselor, to the Spirit of God. And again, the Spirit of God, he is not weird. The Spirit of God really encourages you and, and empowers you to be everything you were created to be. But where a lot of people are in life is they don't, they don't know how to, how to always listen to that Spirit, that nudge of God in their life and in their heart or through his Word. And again, that is spiritual maturity, learning how to hear God's still, small voice in every circumstance, every situation. Spiritual development isn't just learning more books of the Bible, more verses, more church Jesus. The spiritual development is God's growing us up to be something powerful, to be something great in life. And again, Paul, he's in the spiritual development. And as he's raising up this young pastor, his name is Timothy. 
He speaks into his life. And he tells Timothy, look, when you speak into the church's life, I need you to remind them of a few things. And I want to show you what he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He says, make Jesus the anointed one, the one that we have been looking for. Make him your focus. Everybody say focus. Make him your focus in life, Timothy, and in ministry. This is really important. In your life and in your ministry. In who you are and in what you do, Timothy. For he came to earth as a descendant of David and he rose from the dead according to the revelation of the good news, the gospel that God has given me. Paul says, Timothy, I need you to focus. To focus on Jesus, the anointed one. He is the one. Get your focus, get, get your mind on who he is, what he's done, his empowerment in your life, and everything that you do, let that be your focus, who you are and what you do. Put Jesus in the center of everything you are. And he says, now, here's what I need you to do, Timothy. As the leader and as the one that I'm developing, that's developing others, I need you, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, he says, be committed to teach the believers. Be committed to teach the believers. Remind the believers. And again, this is a fascinating word because he's not telling Timothy to remind the unbeliever. He's talking about those who have believed in the finished work of Christ. And when you come to church, you need to be reminded of what to stay focused on and what to basically let go in your life. And so Timothy, he says, be committed to teach the believers all of these things when you are with them in the presence of the Lord. Instruct them to never be drawn. I wrote in my notes here, don't go there. Instruct them to not go there. Everybody say, don't go there. So he says, be focused Stay focused and don't go there. You want to win in life, believer? Stay focused on Jesus and don't go in certain places. And I'm not talking about places you go physically. I'm talking about places you go in your mind. And look what he says. He says, instruct them to never be drawn into meaningless arguments or tear each other down with useless words that only harm others. He says, here's what I need you to teach the believers. Teach the believers to stay focused on Jesus and to not go there, to not go certain places in their mind, to not go certain places in their conversation, to not go certain places with their engagement with one another. In other words, we're a set-apart people by the good news of Christ. Though we live in the world, we're not of the world, and we can learn by the power of the Spirit of God that lives in us not to go there. We are to empower each other. We are to lift each other up. We are to build one another up in Christ Jesus. And again, that doesn't mean pat you on the fanny all the time and tell you how awesome you are when you're not awesome. That means to encourage you. Infuse courage in you to know who you are in Christ Jesus and to walk in the fullness of that each and every day. Don't go there. Empower one another. Share it with one another. Man, we have the gift of God living in us, believers. And he says, let's remind them. Timothy, remind them of who they are. They're not stoic people. They worship an all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at one time. God, let their praises be lifted up because he has rescued them. He has united them. He has helped them become everything that they are created to be. And church, as Quinn stood up here today and he shared the, the vision of going to 5,000, I know that's an astronomical number by the end of 2018 for Barefoot Church in Myrtle Beach. It's huge. But honestly, that's what God has placed in our heart. And, and we got to run after it and we got to run hard after it. 
because there's so many people that need to be empowered. And as I look around the world, again, there's third world countries, there's places around the world that, and there's, there's huge cities, uh, places that are richer than we are around the world. And, and people are hungry, hungry for God, hungry for their neighbor to know God, hunger, hunger for their, their, their co-workers to know who God is. And if God could instill in us the hunger for our friends and our relatives and those who live down the street from us to, to really run after God and empower them, not by just going and telling them about who God is, but letting God become the central focus of our life and our ministry and wherever we go. I wonder how many people would begin to ask us about the one who is alive inside of us the answer, and we would be able to give the answer for the hope inside of us. Do we live a hope-filled life? In other words, when people see you, do they see hope? Do they, do they see do they see God empowering you? Though, though you have some horrific circumstances, have you ever thought about why those horrific things happen? So you can show off for God. So, so when the enemy comes against you, and when the enemy puts pressure in your life, God allows him to do it. Because whenever you are empowered by the God on high, let me remind you of who you are. The pressure can't hold you down. The death didn't hold him in the grave. He rose from the grave and the same power that rose him from the grave lives in you. And whenever things come against you, stand strong, show hope in Christ Jesus. And we gotta encourage each other in that. Because I don't know what's gonna happen in your life this week. You don't know what's going to happen in my life this week. And things happen in this world. But we are here to be encouraged, to motivate, to, to, to not always be downtrodden. I mean, if we really hope in a resurrection, if we really hope in a, in a life to come, eternity with a real God in a real heaven, if we really hope in that, then when death strikes, and separation happens. Yes, it's painful because we're going to miss somebody we were physically attached to. But my friends, we realize that that is not the end of the road. There is still more to come. And you got to hang on to that hope. You got to hang on to the resurrection. Paul says, Timothy, remind the believers that they are rescued unite them around this central message spread this word everywhere and so again i want to title this message today stay focused don't go there stay focused don't go there now in order to look to where not to go paul wrote an entire letter kind of around this whole idea to a church in corinth in your Bibles, it's known as two different letters. There's two different times he wrote the church from a far off distant place, the book of 1 Corinthians in your New Testament and the book of 2 Corinthians. These are simple letters written to the church, to the believers, not unbelievers, but to the believers to remind them of who they are and how to stay focused, how to stay focused and not go there. And the entire book of, of 1 Corinthians is all about basically staying focused on Christ and not going to certain places with your life. You should leave this place this week and start tomorrow morning and read the entire letter of the book of 1 Corinthians through the lens of I'm a believer just like the people in Corinth was. And what does my central focus need to be? And where do I not need to go in my mind? I'm going to outline it for you today. However, again, I encourage you to go and read it because there's simple, there's simple practical things throughout the book of 1 Corinthians because the Corinth was a wild and crazy place. I'm telling you, it was another level. And people were being called out into this message of a resurrected Jesus. They had the power of God living in them. 
But sometimes they would come and be a part of the church and they didn't live like the power of God lived in them. They would continue on with the lifestyle that they had before instead of letting the Spirit of God change them into something and permeate them into the great thing that God had created them to be. So Paul writes in this letter. And the letter is kind of written as a challenge, but it's, it's written in a form where it, it challenges and infuses courage in them. So he starts the letter off in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I kind of want to kind of drop down in the letter and pull a couple of things out and talk about them because I want us to understand what we're to stay focused on and where not to go in our mind. Don't go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. The Bible says this. For the anointed one, again, he's speaking of Jesus. He says, has sent me on a mission. So Paul says, he put me on a mission. You know, the same one that put Paul on a mission put you on a mission. But do you understand what your mission is? He goes on to say this. Not to see how many I could baptize. I think it's important to celebrate numbers. I think it's important to baptize people. But the argument here was, who is the greatest leader in the community? And it was awesome because Paul says, look, I baptized some people when, when I was with you, but I don't even hardly remember their name. I, I think this is important. Because Paul wasn't baptizing people because of who they were. He was baptizing people because of who Jesus is. And he could give a flip about who they were, what his message and mission was, is who is Jesus and has he affected your life and have you died to your old self and been raised to new life? So many people think church is about knowing everybody in, in, in your midst. And I think it's true that we need to have real community and know people. But that's not the object of church. The object of church is not to know everybody, but to share Jesus with everybody we come in contact and let them know that he can resurrect their life too. And I find this fascinating because the moment, as Quinn said this morning, we began to make it about us and not the mission of God is the moment we miss so much about what God wants to do. And we are all important. We all need relationships and we need to work together and we need to be unified. However, Paul's like, look, he says, he says, I, I, I didn't do, I wasn't, I'm not on a mission to see how many people I can baptize, but to proclaim the good news. That's what I'm on mission for. He says, and to declare this message, he says, I declare that this message stripped all philosophical arguments that empty the cross of its true power. He says, for I trust in all, in all, in the all-sufficient cross of Christ alone. To preach the message of the cross seems like sheer nonsense, he says, to those who are on their way to destruction. But to us, that means the believers, but to us who are on our way to salvation, it is the mighty power of God released within us. And this is a fascinating couple of verses in the Bible. Because most believers look at themselves as being saved once when they said a prayer and yes you are saved once by the blood of Jesus from all of your sin he paid a high price on a cross for the sins of humanity but you need to understand that salvation and forgiveness of sin isn't just to remove you from what you were penalized for but you are still being saved into everything that God has created you to be did you catch it when he said that part there at the end? This is what he said. But to us who are on our way to salvation, it is the mighty power of God released within, within us. He says the cross makes no sense to people who don't have a, a, a hunger and a thirst for what God has created them to be. But to those of us who are being saved by the power of the cross and being saved from something and being saved towards something and we're on this amazing journey in life. He says, man, you know, it is, it is the mighty power of God that, that is released within us. So we don't just see the cross and the blood of Jesus and the resurrection. It's a one-time event. 
to bring us out of something. You see, the cross, the blood of Jesus and the resurrection as the event down through history that empowers us to be everything that God has designed us to be. It is the very power of God at work in us. And I find this fascinating because so many people come to meetings like this and they're like, praise the Lord, God's forgiven me of all the bad things I've ever done, you know, in the resurrection. Yes, he has. That is true. But you grab hold of the part that salvation isn't just to forgive you. That's awesome. But that's not why he does it. He does it to connect you. To connect you to your Father in heaven. To connect you to your Creator, to your great God. So you can get a download from God each and every day of your life as you're on your way to eternity and, south, and, and, and things with Him forever and ever and ever. This is powerful. So we all need to learn how to walk with the Spirit of God, be empowered by the cross, keep the, keep the cross and the resurrection of Jesus the central focus of the message. But as we get on... As we continue to look there in 1 Corinthians, I want to show you, as people were coming against Paul and they were saying, look, you know, you're preaching all this fancy message and doing all this stuff. And he's like, no, no, no. He says, I want you to understand, Christ is the central focus. I'm staying focused on him, and I'm not going to go there. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. He says, I urge you, my brothers and sisters. He's not talking to unbelievers now. He's talking to the church. That, that would be many of us in this room today. He says, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, for the sake of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree to live in unity with one another. Basically, if you take that phrase there out of the Bible, it means that, that you may all be of one word, one testimony. That's what the word unity means here. That you be of one word, the cross and resurrection of Jesus, and you would have one testimony. We just sing a whole song about it. That you would be a people unified around one idea, a diverse group of people, but the unity around this one idea is what brings you together and empowers you to change the world. It is the unity around Christ Jesus. God loves diversity, but the day our diversity trumps our purpose is today we are missing the whole good news of the Bible. And I'm glad you got a tattoo. I love tattoos, by the way. I'm not knocking on tattoos. To show how diverse you are and to tell your story. But I invite you to tell his story and not just celebrate your diversity because of who you are. Celebrate who you are in Christ Jesus. I'm proud of your outfit that sets you apart. But my friend, when your outfit becomes the focus of your life and the Jesus who empowers you doesn't become the focus of your life, you're missing everything. And we live in this world, especially in this culture, where we become a bunch of individuals and we're not united around anything because we promote this. You know what? It's, it, you're your own person. We're an independent group of people. You know, we're, we're, we're a, you know, even in our, in our culture, and again, we're non-denominational. We're an independent church. We're not independent. We're totally dependent. Yeah. <laughs> Upon the good news of Jesus Christ. And here's the deal. Sometimes we celebrate how awesome we are and, and how different we are. Nothing wrong with being different. God loves diversity. He created it. But the day your diversity trumps God's purpose, it's the day you miss the whole purpose of life. And yes, God created me with a certain skin color. God created you with a certain skin color. But the day it becomes about skin color and not about Jesus is the day we miss the purpose of the church. He created some of us male, some of us female. And it's awesome because it wouldn't be no more human beings
if we didn't have a seed and we didn't have an egg. However you put them things together, I don't know. Well, I do know. They're making up all kinds of ways to put them together today. And what I want to tell you today is it's awesome. Be who God has created you to be, but always be it in the context of making Jesus famous in this world because God created gender on purpose to magnify his great name. There's a compassionate side of God. There's a warrior side of God. And when we unify together and we begin to walk in the fullness of our purpose, my friends, the world begins to know who Jesus is. It's not about being a woman or a man. It's about being Jesus and walking together and sharing him with the world. Paul says, he says, man, let it be a, a, a testimony. He says, put to rest any divisions that attempt to tear you apart. In other words, he says, don't go there. He says, stay focused on Jesus and don't go there. He says, be, uh, he says, be restored as one united body living in perfect harmony. Form a consistent choreography. I love how this puts this, among yourselves. In other words, dance Dance in a, an incredible purpose with diversity. He says, having a common perspective with, with shared uh, values. And, and so if we're going to do this, we got to re be reminded that first and foremost of what is the clarity of the good news. It is this. Any way you want to package it, any way you want to frame it, that God has already sent the Messiah the liberator into the world that God himself put on flesh and came to earth and he died in humanity's place in the form of a human. His name was Jesus. He is the, he is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the liberator. He came to be like us because humanity was separated from the creator. And he came and he paid a high price for the sin of humanity. But he didn't, sin didn't keep him in the grave. Nothing held him in the grave. He resurrected because the power of God was at, 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 at work in Jesus, in the Christ of body. And so I find this fascinating because the cross of Christ is the forgiveness of our sin and the, and the place of empowerment for us to become everything that God has created us to be in the resurrection. And so the message is clear. You package it any kind of way you want to. But until you put your faith in this central message, you'll never understand the power of the cross. You, you may understand the message of the cross, but you don't understand the power of the cross. Because the power of the cross allows you to come in contact with the Creator, with the Father, with the one God, the cross doesn't for, just forgive you, it gives you total access to God. And so God comes and lives in the human heart and empowers us to walk every step of the way. We call it the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity. But never forget that Jesus and this cross and this blood is what gave us the access. Again, it's great to be forgiven, but are you walking and are you empowered daily, situationally, by the God of the universe? Because Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And anyone that comes to the Father comes through me. And I need you to grab hold of it. The, the death of Christ wasn't just for forgiveness, it was for empowerment. And this is the power of the cross and the resurrection. It unleashed God's power in the human heart for us to become everything that God has created us to be. He paid for something we couldn't pay for ourselves. It's a gift from God. But never lose this central focus. And again, we share it all kinds of ways here at Barefoot Church. And, and we've got to understand, you know what, and bring clarity to that message over and over again, we illustrated all kinds of ways, but the reason for all of that 
is so that we keep that to be our focus. Stay focused. Everybody say, stay focused. And then, don't go there. <laughs> the second thing we need to be reminded of is, is to have unity around this good news. Because, again, that's what the word gospel means. We were singing about it in some of those songs. It means good news. It's good news. It's awesome news. In spite of what's happening, there's good news. In spite of what's going on, there's good news. It doesn't matter what happens around There's good news. So I can lay down my head tonight, and some bad things happened throughout the day. I had some conversations I don't like to have, all those kind of things. But, but when I lay my head down at night, I got good news. And everything don't always work in the way I think it should work every single day, every single moment. But I got good news. I have been rescued and I have been united to the God of the universe and I got some people around me. It's called the church that help encourage me and empower me and we're united around this one idea. My friends, I invite you into this game. I invite you into this body. I invite you into this amazing opportunity that God has given every single one of us. And again, we're not participating. We're not involved. We're just sitting on the sidelines. Here's the deal. You're missing so, so much of what God wants to do in your life. I made a new greeter tonight. And, and this particular greeter said, you know, I, I've been sitting there. I keep hearing this message over and over. And I, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to show up. I'm going to smile at people, shake some hands. I'm going to encourage some people. That, that's what being part of the body is. And, and that person said, man, I feel awesome. And I could tell they had, had the glow of Jesus in their life. Because you know why? Because they were being used by the hand of God to bring encouragement to people as they walked in the door at this very service. I need you to know that's what happens. It's like me. You know, whenever the message, whenever God's word is connecting with the soul of people, I'm encouraged. Again, I don't stand up here to give a good speech. I really don't. The whole reason I stand up here with a microphone often is this. It's because I believe so much in how the hope that I have found in Christ Jesus is available to humanity, and I want to empower people with this message of, of the Spirit of God and their purpose in life. I stand up here, and I say it, and I spray it, wheel it, deal it, every way I can feel it, every kind of way I can do it in order to help people become everything that God has created them to be. Why, why do I do it? Again, it's not to get a hand cut. It's because I'm encouraged. And when, when, when people, just notice about, about any preacher, okay, that if they're standing up here sharing the word of God and you're engaged, oh, they're like, heck yeah. That's encouraging because it means God's working in your life and in your heart. But if you sit there like a knot on a log, as my granddaddy used to say, and you're not engaged. I'm not talking about just all you hooping and hollering and stuff. But if you're not in, if you're not full on, and you're not engaged, then here's the deal: it, it sucks the life out of the room. Amen. And and that's the truth of the matter. And, and so this is why I'm so much about the church being engaged. Again, you got to be engaged. You got to be engaged because if you're not engaged, here's the deal: you cannot everything that God has created you to be. Mark my word, I said not in that. If you're not engaged, you cannot. Because this life we live is a life of faith. What faith means is, you know what? I'm going to engage with God's purpose even though I haven't seen it happen yet. I got hope in it and I engage with it and I walk along this journey every step of the way. Faith is engagement. And so we got to unify and I want to hit these points real quick like, and again, I'm going to let you go home and study them. But we need to unify around the good news. And basically in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3, the, the church there, the church at Corinth had, had divided over which, which leader to follow. That's why Paul said, look, I don't know who the heck I baptized. And that's not really what's important anyway. What's important is the good news of Christ. Because they were arguing over you know, I belong to the best denomination. And again, you know, I'm, I'm all for, for building one another up, encouraging one another, competition. I'm a competitive person. 
But I need you to understand this today. That the goal isn't to have more Christ followers than the church down the road. The, the, the goal is every church in our community would have numerous Christ followers empowered to change the city and change the world. And again, it takes, it takes people, it takes momentum. And honestly, the prayer in my heart is every church would have momentum and they would have somebody at the hem of the church that has the audacity to stand in front of people and say, if you ain't growing, we ain't going. If we ain't doing it, then it ain't gonna happen because God wants us to do something. He wants us to give, he wants us to serve, he wants us to share, he wants to empower us. So you, you, you gotta have a pen and a cushion. You gotta be a spur in every, side, in every saddle. It has to be, you know? And again, uh, there, there has to be a butthole in everybody. That's the more blunt way to put it. So I guess that's my part sometimes. And I'm okay with being called three-letter words. Because sometimes, you know what? That just needs to happen. There just needs to be a movement in the church. And some things need to get out and some fresh things need to get in. That's called vitamins. And if you don't have somebody saying, look, we need to move it, and, and we just become stagnant, and we become constipated? Are you kidding me? And I'm being funny, but, but the truth of the matter is, you got to have this. Because if you don't, man, the, the church becomes stagnant. Because you know, if you don't have somebody saying, let's keep the focus around Jesus, and let's go reach the world and show them who Christ is through our gifts, talents, and resources, it is your purpose, and I can't wait till Jesus comes back because he is going to gather that group of people, and we are going to have an eternal home with him. It's not about us. It's about, it's about him. And so we got to be unified. First, first Corinthians chapter 1 through, uh, 1 through 3 was all about who is who. You know, it's all about comparison. And again, it's not about comparison. Chapter 6 through 8 was, was basically about the limits of their freedom that they had found in Christ Jesus. Can we do this? Can we do that? Can, can we, can we, can we not? Can we? What's, the, what's the rules? And Paul's like, look, why y'all keep worrying about all that stuff? There, there's freedom in Christ Jesus. And there's things you shouldn't do as a Christ follower, and there's things you should do as a Christ follower. It's the character of God. He speaks to that. It's not about finding freedom about what I can do and I can't do. It's about finding freedom in a connection, listen to me, to the God of the universe and letting his character get in me and purge the old me out and put the new me in and walking in the fullness of who he says I am each and every day. And so it's understanding who God is. The freedom is understanding who God is. And I promise you this, when you read God's word and you begin to understand, it won't never be about what can I get away with. It'll be about what needs to get out of me so I can be empowered to be everything that God has created me to be. And, and, you know, and again, 6 through 8 was all about can we do this, can we do that? You know, uh, you know what, what can the church do? What can it do? And Paul says, well, here's one thing you can't do. Keep being sexually immoral. He says, God has to sin against your own body. He says, it's ridiculous. And, he, and he's hitting it hard. Why does he say that? And the reason he says that is because that's a great desire put inside the human body. But, but you need to learn to have God bring that under control by the power of his spirit and begin to, to live out who God is as, as a people of God. Because this is a character issue. It's an it's a identity issue. And I say it all the time. People are trying to find their identity in all these relationships. And again, the only identity you will ever find of who you really are is at the foot of the cross and understanding the resurrection of Jesus and let the very power of God get in you and purge out the old self and put the new self in. What can we do and what we can't do? Again, that's not, Paul's like, church, Corinth, that's not the questions we need to be asking. It's, it's, about, 
It's about unifying around this one message of Christ Jesus. And then, you know, chapter 11 was all about status. And there's instructions for the Lord's Supper there. But the reason he had to speak to them because they were so focused on status. Can I tell you if, if what, what causes disunity is these things, comparison, the whole idea, what's the rule book say, what does the rule book doesn't say. And it begins to cause divisions. And then this one right here, status, who, you know, who, who, who am I because of what I have? That's what, what really matters. And again, I'm glad you got what you got. I'm glad I've got what I've got. I've been so blessed by God physically in this, in this earth. I really have. I'm blessed beyond your imagination. And, and, and you know, but the interesting thing is, I'm not blessed because of who I am. I'm blessed because of who he is and what my assignment is. And I need you to know today, I don't care who you are or what your status is. I believe that God created you for a significant purpose to join in with a local church. And again, it's not about what you have or don't have, whether you can take the Lord's Supper and come in communion to us. It's about, you know, it's not about a social status. It's all about this. It's all about knowing who Christ Jesus is and living it out empowered with great hope that he is coming back to the rescue of his church. So they were dividing up with status. And then the next chapters, 12 through 14, is all about spiritual gifts. And they're talking about who has the greatest gifts that the Spirit's given. And, and Paul, it's like, guys, come on, man. We're the church. We all got a gift. And it's not about my gift or your gift. It's about using the gifts in unity together and spreading the good news of who Jesus is around the world. And he's like, stop desiring certain gifts because you don't have it. And just walk in the fullness of your gift because, again, it's not that one gift is greater than the other gifts. It's about, it's about unifying around the message of Christ. And I can tell you this, God has equipped every one of us that are believers in a special way. And he's looking for this harmony, this connection wrapped around Christ Jesus and us living it out each and every day. Not with jealousy, not with reckless ambition towards one another, not with tearing one another down, but it's about building one another up. It's about empowering one another. And he says, look, he's, and that's what the whole, the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 is all about. It's called the love chapter. A lot of people read it at weddings. And it's got some things to do with weddings, but it really has more to do with the church. Because the, the letter was written to the church, not about a wedding between a man and a woman. It was written to the church about the unity of the Spirit of God that gives the spiritual gifts to people, to empower people to be everything they're created to be. And he says, you know what? I can have the greatest gifts in the world. In 1 Corinthians 13. He says, but if I don't have the love of Christ in my heart, Amen. Amen. using my gifts, he said, my, my gifts are really worthless. So he's saying, let the cross and the empowerment of Christ be the central focus and don't go there. Build one another up in the word of Christ. The next thing I wrote down is this, is we need to be reminded to multiply. And again, the whole reason we unify is to multiply. Bring the diverse gifts together. We do celebrate diversity, celebrate who you are, but we celebrate who he is and how he's empowering us as a diverse people. This is the beauty of God. There's nothing else in the world that can draw a diversity of people together like the love of Christ can. No matter what your background is, where you're from. Our, our human tendency is to migrate towards everybody who is like us. But God's tendency, the spiritual tendency, is to migrate towards people who are different than us. And you say, what do you mean? What I mean is not, not just going to a different tribe or a different tongue, but, but really saying, you know what? You need my gift and I need your gift. And together, we can work together to really begin to spread this good news of who Jesus is around the world. 
That's unifying with, with love. I, I recognize your gift. I don't like the way you act sometimes. And we're different. And, you know, yes, we can be friends and we can be all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we may not, we, you know, you, you may not like football and I may like football. I'm not really that crazy about it. I used to play, but it's boring to me now. Anyway, but, but some people do, you know. So they want to sit around and talk about football all day. I don't want to talk about football all day. Okay? What I want to talk about is how to grow the church. And my wife will tell you this, that if, if you want to engage in conversation with me, I, I'll talk about how awesome your hair is and, you know, your Aunt Betty's toenail and all that kind of stuff for a little while. But I'm more interested in you and who you can become in Christ Jesus. And I'm more interested in connecting you to the church. And I understand the compassion that I got I to gotta love you where you are. But I am, I, 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 everything inside of me, the spirit that God has put inside of me wants to grab you by the nap of your collar and snatch you into the kingdom of God and say, look, listen, big boy. Come on, girl. You can do it. It's awesome. God's amazing. Don't pout. Let's go. Let's win. Let's change the world. Let's unify. Let's multiply. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Let me just read this in closing because I need to shut her down. I think I'm four minutes over. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new. And he re reconciled us to himself. Look what it says. And he has given us the ministry. No matter who we are, whether we hold a microphone, whether we're the preacher at Barefoot Church, whether we live in a neighborhood, whether we stay at home mom, he has given us, 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 the ministry of reconciling others to God. It is our ministry. So I celebrate diversity. And I say this because everybody in here has a role. Understand what your role is. Join up with the local church and empower people and invite people and make people hunger and thirst after God through your gift. You know, if you're a stay-at-home mom, there's a reason you're there. It's not just, you know, so your child has an awesome mom at home. It's, it's because God gave you that assignment. God gave you that assignment. Let me tell you something. Be the best you can be at what God's called you to be because you're raising up a world changer and your assignment is no less than my assignment holding a microphone. God's called you to run a business. You run that business with the integrity of God in your heart. We're reconciling the world to Jesus, man. And everybody else is doing things back askwards or however you say that. Wrong, focused on themselves. No integrity. You keep being integrity. You keep doing the right thing. You keep doing the God thing. You keep saying the right thing. Even when nobody else wants to say the right thing, you keep doing it. This is what makes Christ a shine. I don't give a flip what the rest of the world's doing and what the law says. I care what Christ Jesus has said and walking in integrity every step of the way. Be who God has created you to be. Unify. Stand to your feet. Let's, let's pray, and then we're going to worship one more time tonight. God, I thank you so much for this empowering message. God, I thank you so much for the unity of your spirit. And God, I pray we would be focused on who Jesus is, our testimony. God, we would be unified in mission and purpose around Jesus. God, we would celebrate diversity. We would empower one another's diversity. But God, we would come together and we would change the world. God, I look across this room tonight. This is a powerful force here. Every man, woman, boy, and girl is here tonight for a reason. 
And it's to begin to help others know who Christ Jesus is. And it's to fill this place up overflowing with 10, 20, 30 services and, and doing more campuses. God, it's about really sharing who Jesus is. And God, I thank you for the pizza. But most of all, I thank you for Jesus, and the one who brought us together today. And my friend, if you don't know that Jesus, just right where you stand today, say, God, today I need your empowering grace. Tell God, thank you for the blood of Christ right where you stand today. Tell God, thank you for the resurrection. Tell God you put your hope in a perfect Jesus who died in your place and resurrected from a grave. And today you're gonna put your faith in that Jesus. I don't care how you say it, just tell God thank you in your heart today. And my friend, if you said that prayer, I wanna say welcome to the family. You're not an outcast. You're a brother, you're a sister, you're a child of the living God and you have purpose. And we're gonna sing again and we're gonna sing hallelujah. So I want you to lift your voices today and expect God to do the amazing. Come on church.